Welcome to Post Doom, regenerative conversations exploring overshoot grief, grounding, and gratitude. I'm Michael Dowd, and I'm normally the host. I've sometimes had co-hosts, Ganga Devi Braun, Carolyn Baker, Jennifer Hines, my wife Connie Barlow have occasionally co-hosted with me. In this episode, though, I've invited Terry Patton to actually cross-post a conversation that he had on his State of Emergence podcast. So Terry will serve as the host and uh, the person who interacts with Margaret Wheatley. Terry and I have known each other for years. I consider him a close brother in this work. Make sure you check out my own post-Doom conversation with Terry that was uploaded a few months ago. And Terry mentioned to me that he had had this ex extraordinary conversation with Meg Wheatley. And I listened to this thinking I was just gonna be preparing for my own conversation with Meg Wheatley. And I was so blown out of the water with the quality of what she shared and what Terry drew out of her and his amazing ability to listen with humility, generosity. It was just an incredible conversation, but it was all done on audio. And so after I listened to it, Connie and I both, she said she'd love to have the video if it was done. And he said that he'd be honored to have this appear as a post-Doom conversation. So this is an excerpted conversation. I encourage you to actually go to the State of Emergence uh, podcast to listen to the whole thing. And uh, also margaretwheatley.com to learn more of what Meg Wheatley's amazing work. We've titled this episode, Opening to the World. So there are three previews that we start with. Preview one. There is something to be warned here, which is that hope is always accompanied by fear. And so if the motivation for our work is based on a sense of if uh, I hope for this to happen, then when it doesn't happen, we move into a much deeper level of depression or anger or feeling powerless. And, you know, in Buddhist teaching, uh, all of our relationship to reality is summed up by the phrase of, well, you're working from hope, which means hope and fear. You can't distinguish them because, as one teacher said, expectations, and that's what we're talking about here with hope, expectations are just premeditated disappointment. <laughs> We're setting ourselves up for disappointment. And it's worse than that, a sense of despair and grief when all of our good plans, expectations, and work not only don't happen, but we see the reverse happen. Preview two. You cannot take on this formation of one's leadership as now I'm really a warrior, a champion for to preserve and protect the human spirit, people, and also the spirit of life. You can't take that on if you think there's any chance that we're pulling out of this. Preview three. The very behaviors I seek to be non-aggressive, gentle, trustworthy, decent, moral, and brave, the path to those is not through anything else except opening to the world. The conversation begins. There are many people who are facing the high probability of near-term societal collapse, uh, the deep adaptation uh, groups, the uh, the post-doom conversations that uh, Michael Dowd and Connie Barlow have been convening. And I think you're coming from a somewhat different place. You do share uh, uh, the same conclusion that right. uh, it ain't going any further in the words of uh, Leonard Cohen. <laughs> <laughs> I have seen the future and it's murder is my favorite Leonard Cohen line right now. When I have taught, as I have now for decades, in people realizing, oh, there are other ways to see human beings. There are other ways to see how the planet operates. There are other ways to understand this enormously constantly creative world. Um, that's been the greatest gift until recently 
where I felt I was giving people a choice in how to see, how to experience life. And once you do that, you're not deconstructing. You're removing the scales from the eyes of people. And, and then that experience is always energizing, even joyful when people see, oh, there is possibility. There is another way to see this and another way to experience it. Having been in that vein of offering people a choice of how you experience life in organizations, in your personal relationships, in your inner being, um, that was always the greatest gift early on um, that I was offering choice. I didn't know that at the beginning, but that clearly became um, the return that I got from doing all this. And one of my most beautiful moments was when I was teaching a lot in South Africa and Zimbabwe, and I could offer the scientific validation of the importance of relationships, of the fundamental need for community, all these things that were in traditional cultures. This is still a great source of delight for me. These truths, these fundamental ways of being that are in traditional cultures that were just dismissed and disregarded as, well, you have to get modern. You have to move into uh, cost-benefit analyses. You have to think in terms of efficiencies. You have to think in terms of roles and responsibilities. Get with it. Um, so destructive of what indigenous people knew. And then they lost it because they got into this um, it was un, 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 they could not deny the need to move into the modern paradigm and it was completely destructive of them, their cultures and a great loss to the world. So when I was working in the 90s post Mandela, uh, after Mandela came into power and then for many, many years after that, even recently working in South Africa and Zimbabwe, it was always the greatest gift I could give them was the validation of their traditional ways and practices through the lens of modern Western science. You know, like Westerners got it wrong. Your ancestors did not. <laughs> um, and now the science validates that. So, but in all of this, I realize, you know, my most recent book, which is now three years old, Who Do We Choose to Be? comes full circle to the realization that we need to wake up, see past our filters and our paradigm, which is so, so destructive really of any form of life, uh, both natural and human. And once we see past it, we realize we have choice. Now that is the work of a conscious mind, of a conscious human that we can see more than through reflex, instinct, habit, and then we have choice. And I think that would be the fundamental theme I would say now that my work has been about giving people choice. And that's why it's summed up in who do we choose to be now? Mm. You're, you're seeing our current decadent culture in the process of, of an unraveling that is, I think, in your view, inevitable. And there's a relaxing, releasing of idealistic hopes for a right. <laughs> new paradigm shift that'll avert the worst and, and that sort yes. of thing. And that this disillusionment is uh, foundational to really having the choice to show up in the ways that are life-affirming and constructive in, in an authentic way. And I think that's a hard message for people to take in, and, and yet it, it may be actually a more, uh, a more affirming, and uh, it, 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 there may be more grounded joy available on the other side of that choice than any other alternative, perhaps. 
I want yes. to give you a chance to explain how you got there, what that means. Yeah. I've been, a, I mean, I majored in history as well as biology in college. And I feel that for many years, I then sort of left that training behind. Um, and everything I am saying now is not my personal perspective, it's history. It's just bringing history forward to understand where we are. The history of human civilizations is incredibly precise. And you see these patterns, no matter where the culture was formed, no matter what era it was in, um, we always manifest in identical ways, always. As an organizational person, this was at first pretty confronting to me because we start with self-organized communities, participative leadership, no formal leaders as the big boss, uh, a concept of leaders as generous and having to prove their merit by how much they give away or how much they support other people. You would never, in a communal village setting, which is our first form of organizing in clans and tribes, you would never put yourself above other people if you were had a certain leadership role. But size matters. And once we grow to a certain size, we start to form roles and hierarchy. This was very upsetting to me at first, having worked for so long in the first you know, the need for participative leadership. Um, we form hierarchies and gradually those hierarchies become over bureaucratized. We always, this is, I found so fascinating. This is not my work. This is reading great work of historians and um, observers, anthropologists in particular. We always build infrastructure of roads irrigation systems. We always have a mercantile class. We always have, of course, farming and agriculture. We have always formed courts of law. We always have a cultural life that is tied to the religion. I mean, culture is not a separate expression in most cultures until the very end. And more and more power is amassed to the top while greater bureaucracy um, gets formed. And eventually people become uh, just, the bureaucracies cannot support themselves. They implode from the economics of their own existence. And of course, then they also, um, cannot provide the services that they were created for. The other dimension, which I do, br I do bring in the work of two incredible uh, historians, social scientists, and economists. Um, so the first <laughs> expression that we create these over, overbearing hierarchies and bureaucracies that then implode from their own weight. Does I, that come from uh, Tainter, I think? Yes, that's Joseph Tainter's work. And he is the seminal thinker about the com collapse of complex societies, without a doubt. He wrote that first, his first tome in the late 80s and has just since been right on about his analysis. And he looked at over a dozen civilizations and saw the pattern and realized I really don't have to look at it anymore. The pattern is so clear. The other pattern is about human development and societies and ex human expectations. So now I'm talking about the work of Sir John Glubb, who was a British military high command officer in the Middle East and Jordan. He started studying the rise and fall of Mid-Eastern and Asian civilizations. And the pattern is just, it just makes sense. 
you start with self-sacrifice and then as you develop a stable economy and a good merchant class and there are more and more material benefits of being in that culture, you push off self-service, I mean self-sacrifice to a military and um, you gradually develop more and more comforts in your life and therefore you develop more and more expectations and a sense of entitlement. And in all of this, this takes about 250 years, according to him, it's 10 generations. Each generation wants more at the material and consumer level because it's available. And by the end, he has six stages. The last one is the age of decadence at, at that time. And this is what startled me into, oh, pay attention here. This pattern is specific down to details. In the age of decadence, what every human civilization worships is sports stars, entertainers, and musicians. So you could just look at that, but there are other aspects to the pattern that are also completely descriptive of ourselves right now. The elites take everything for themselves. They have no thought for the common people. They have no thought for ecological disaster, which we always do also. And they just um, are blinded to the, by their own greed and their own self-preservation. And they believe they can get away with it. It follows um, this sort of uh, self-serving greed uh, happens after a period when the elites and the leaders felt they could be of great benefit to everyone. The welfare state is partly what develops prior to this age of decadence. They start hospitals, they start educational institutions. I mean, there are stories from Byzantine of, you know, a, a hospital in every town. Um, we have our own, in the U.S., our own education state supported universities, those are all being defunded in a, in a dramatic way. I mean, basically defunded in some states like Arizona. But for that time period when the elites, the leaders feel they are going to live forever, they are great, and they are in giveaway mode. And then people develop an experience of uh, demanding entitlements more and more, but there's no more money and the doors shut, the institutions close down, the hospitals disappear. This is the pattern. Now, it's so easy to see this at this time in our culture, in our civilization, but it's not just the US. Uh, we're out front for sure in poor healthcare, closing educational institutions, just uh, intense worship of sports and uh, sports heroes and musicians and entertainers. But it's a global phenomenon now. There is such a thing as global culture. And that's how, what the pandemic has exposed for us in many ways. You know, we have had such a an age of exuberant uh, wealth and consumption, we've had an unparalleled access right. to knowledge and wisdom traditions and uh, arts and sciences, and that has created an enormous group of people who've been able to access all the self-cultivation, wisdom traditions in the world in conversation with each other and the methods of science at, at a time when the whole process of evolution, cosmic, biological, and cultural is all beginning to knit together. Couldn't this create a, a critical mass of possible coherence and wisdom that could be the seeds of something else? And isn't there an opportunity that we're given by being born in this time when it's as if the eyes of evolution are open to itself as never before through us? And shouldn't we uh, let the great mystery know itself and adore itself through us and serve itself through us in a way that can bring about something else? And isn't there some possibility in all of that? All I can say is good luck with that 
on, if I just go through some of your assumptions. Um, and I'm familiar with your background, so I do know where they come from. We are not the height of evolution. We are not, um, we have been so blinded. I mean, I, I rely now on much greater understandings of the cosmos and how the universe may work through working with very, um, with my teachers who are mystics, who are enlightened ones. Um, for us to believe that we are creating a critical mass or that there's an enormous number of people who are now waking up to the powers of mind, to the, uh, the presence of uh, working with consciousness rather than just working at the material level, that's not an enormous number. How many people are on the planet? Is it 7.3 or has it already gone up to 7.5 a billion people? How many people are really seriously focused on developing their consciousness? It's a minute percentage of the world's population. If you want to talk about critical mass, um, which I actually believe is a faulty concept, but let's just play with it for a moment. Who, who are, who's in the critical mass in terms of their awareness, their consciousness, their ability to focus on anything outside of survival? Well, that's half of the world's population right there. At least 3.5 billion people are, are living hand to mouth at some level or have insufficient amounts of food or, or livelihood. How many of the rest of us who do live in a fair amount of comfort are focused on our own development or are we focused on material gain? I mean, the whole consumer, the, the pressure to just participate as a consumer is an in these realms of being entertained. This is not about a whole culture with masses of people creating um, a new level of awareness. We are capable of it as humans, yes, but just, just play with numbers and percentages there, and it's quite depressing where the majority of humans are. Some through circumstances and some through this utterly seductive consumer global culture, which defines us in minimal ways and promulgates the belief that we are naturally competitive and aggressive, whatever. And, and it bribes us in a sense with those comforts and conveniences. Of course, and it, it seduces us um, because our lives, a small percentage of people on the planet now live lives of great comfort, material advantage, and um, comforts beyond anyone's expectation, physical comforts beyond anyone's expectation. But are we happy? Are we content? Are we growing? Are we spiritually awake? No, we're in incredibly depressed, massive amounts of addiction throughout those, the first, first uh, world countries. So what is going on here? Well, I do not for a moment believe that we're at an evolutionary cusp. I believe, I know that ancient civilizations going back 10,000 years in Indian culture, 3,000 years, 4,000 years back, um, they were much more awake and much less distracted. And yet they too eventually imploded for a variety of reasons. Um, so I, I want us to look truthfully at history and not get seduced by some super special role we think we're playing. I mean, to say for a moment that the universe is working through us, I just find the height of arrogance 
I can't even comprehend it. That's not the cosmos. Um, and we've made ourselves, this very small group of us, into this super special human that we're going to lead the way to a tipping point in human consciousness and then everything will lift off lift up if not lift off the planet and there will be this profound shift in consciousness which then affects the material world well if that was going to happen it would have happened in ancient tibet when there were hundreds of thousands of enlightened ones monks who could leave the body um, or it would have happened in india with the huge proportion of yogis and mystics who were there it's just part of our outrageous arrogance at this time in western culture to think that we're so special or we're at the height of conscious evolution and we can create it for everyone i i don't get it and you can obviously hear i have a lot of emotion about it it's just that's not who humans are it's not who we've been we have been wiser we have been more conscious in ancient civilizations even going back a thousand years in tibet as individuals we can absolutely change and need to change and cultivate our awareness, develop a higher consciousness so that, so that this is where it shifts. Not that we're going to uh, then somehow shift all of, all of humanity or how we are together, but this is my warrior for the human spirit work. We want to shift our own awareness and our own capacities working with consciousness working with awakeness, working with compassionate heart, so that we can serve all the humans, the 7.3 billion of us who are just facing increased suffering. And there's a lot more to come now. Because um, I'm actually outraged. I have to say it because I'm outraged by this perspective that we're so special. Yeah. And that we have a role to play with the universe. Oh my God two trillion galaxies and we're special it just do the well, math well well it would seem that your emotion stems from care at, at root there's something you care about and you see that this uh you're being kind grandiosity <laughs> as as a uh delusion that prevents people from being present to what's real in yes. a way that can contribute. And that is so it, compassionately voiced, Jerry. Thank you. It's true, but I do also have a lot of pent up uh, aggression in what I just said. Mm. But I like your interpretation much better than my own. <laughs> but let's be real here it's both, right? I don't think there's any time to waste in working with those of us who have the gift of time and practice and spiritual teachings and intention and motivation to serve. There is no time to be lost. Uh, there's so much work to be done in offering ourselves as um, compassionate presences for people who are suffering terribly. And um, I don't do that because I believe I'm super special or that by working on myself, I'm part of lifting up other people. No, I just know there is work to be done from the, from the compassionate heart mind. Um, and let's get on with it and stop this. It's quite egocentric to me. Uh, this delusion of being so special as this, at this time as a human being. It, it, it feels to me like the, the context for the conversation, the reason I'm interested in talking with you has to do with the positive work, the warriors for the human spirit work that yeah. has motivated you. You're not primarily out there with your warrior's sword 
just negating others, you're primarily trying to make a compassionate offering. Yes. And that compassionate offering, you might be distinguishing it from other people who are intending to bring their care, but in a way that you think is diluted and, 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 and off the mark. But at root, it's because you have a sense that there is something worth doing. You wouldn't right, want to... Sure. Want to want want to critique something else unless there was a better alternative, and that's what you're devoted to. Definitely, definitely. So I want to give you a chance to really talk passionately about what you do think is possible and where your energy is. Well, going. the first, first, thank you, and the first place to start is my view, uh, which is my set of. Uh, my clarity about where we are as a civilization. Because in the past, I worked on innovation. I worked on creative alternatives. I worked um, supporting activists who were developing new ways to do everything from uh, local currencies to uh, local villages and self-sufficiency and um, green technologies. I mean, the whole range of people who are out there creating a more positive future by their experimentation, their innovation, their creativity. And then I realized at some point um, that we could not change these larger systems at the level at which they needed to be changed. They were strong emergent systems and you never change an emergent system. It, it is what it is. And if you wanna create change, you start over, you create fresh alternatives. I was still in that work until 2011 when I realized that, oh, not only can we not save them or change these large systems now that rule us, but um, the, the work of value now for leaders is to become defenders and protectors of people, of what is being destroyed, which I called the human spirit. This is in the tradition of the Shambhala warrior prophecy that Joanna Macy spent her whole life promoting and speaking and inviting people into. I was in working with that prophecy of, which was a complete description of this time when great powers possess weapons of mass destruction and threaten to destroy one another constantly and life hangs by the frailest of threats. Um, and that is the time when the Shambhala warriors come forth. I realized that in my own work, I had access to leaders <laughs> and I have access to this prophecy. I have a deep spiritual grounding in it now. And so my work about five years ago, maybe six, was to start to create the, po the ways that we could train in warriorship, that we could train as people, as leaders who wanted to stay but who needed a whole different set of skills beyond the ones I'd been teaching, high engagement, uh, hosting, leader as host, um, working with self-organization, working with living systems, dynamics, all of that, working in partnership with the planet, all of that is a whole skill set that I think a lot of people have now. They know how to think systemically, they know how to be good listeners, they know that community, doing community-based change work is very powerful. I had taught all of that. I had seen the results, not because of me, but because those were generally uh, picked up and made, uh, there were so many people who became their life's work to how to train people to be in healthy communities and how to host rather than uh, tell people what to do. All of that was covered. I felt the skill set was there. And yet what leaders are now up against is this, and now it's just here, 
but over the past five years, what were leaders facing that they could not resolve with those leadership skills. And I turned to my own practice and my own spiritual development, as well as my leadership understanding that we needed really to be able to develop stable minds, to know our minds, to not be uh, victimized by our thoughts, to be able to respond rather than react. All of the skills and uh, capabilities one develops through meditation. For me, there's no other way to really get to know your mind and therefore be able to move past it except through meditation. So developing a stable mind is a core part of our training. So is direct perception. Really being able to see more clearly, take in more information without our usual habitual filters and biases. We also develop mind-body awareness and centering and grounding through, in our case, Qigong. There are many ways to do that. For me personally, as someone who is known for her work in leadership, what I felt was needed was a, really a, a, like a traditional formation process that you would go through if you were becoming a monk or a nun in any faith. You really uh, give up your old identities um, all of which are manufactured anyway, but you give them up and take on this higher role of no matter what position I'm in, no matter what, I'm a teacher, I'm a CEO, I'm a financier, I'm a nonprofit leader, I'm an artist, I'm a concerned parent, whatever those roles are, the one that now supersedes it is warrior. And what that means I got so much pushback, oh, well, that's aggression. Well, it is in some cases and not in all, but I couldn't find a better word for it, that warriors are people who set themselves apart, train continuously, and are completely dedicated to service. Whether they do that through violent means or nonviolent means is the distinction between a spiritual warrior and a military warrior. But the tradition of uh, protection and dedication and discipline and training and knowing that you're willing to sacrifice in order to protect and defend something, that was, uh, that was the only tradition I wanted that really expressed what I was feeling as the next role for leaders. It's not a mass movement because as Sir John Glubb also expresses in his history, he said, there are always only a few people who just, who realize that in order to preserve community requires self-sacrifice and discipline. And those few people that I'm calling warriors. He said, always raise the banner of duty and service above the degradation and despair of their time. So we've been now training leaders from, I think we're up to 37 countries, all ages, a preponderance of women, which I love. Um, and and they are still in leadership positions, but they're offering a very different presence. They're offering a, a quality of calmness, availability, openness, and confidence that is so well needed, is so needed. And people are responding to us. I mean, we are like magnets in many meetings or places where we're leading that people you know, are attracted to our very presence because we've worked to overcome our triggers, our, our judgments, our preconceived assessments, and we're working constantly to be more open and therefore more available, but within the view that the suffering will increase. Now, we've just had this 
experience of the suffering of people, joblessness, homelessness, hunger, everywhere, even in the developed countries. You're not just speaking about what's happened just recently through the pandemic, but even prior to that. No, I'm saying the pandemic took us on a rocket ship ride into the numbers of people who are now fearful and suffering is an exponential leap. We've been preparing for this. We were expecting collapse. So we're not pushing that reality away and we're not being caught in an illusion. Well, this could open us to a wonderful new world where we notice, uh, we pay attention to how nice it is when the air is silent and the air is clean. So maybe we'll really get serious about environmental improvements or people saying, well, there's so much caring and goodness out there, which is absolutely factual. So maybe we will now always be that way or we'll develop a more caring society and business models. You know, years ago, the leader of uh, the EU talked about um, capitalism with a human face. So some people are saying, well, that's what we're seeing right now. Absolutely. It's extraordinary to see that social responsibility has come of age. Um, But what's going to happen when companies try and reconstitute themselves, when they're fighting for their survival? Are they going to work from really different values, lower profits, more more equity, more justice? I don't think so. I don't think so, because the business models, that's one of the things I'm tracking, but the business models are not set up for that. And um, I don't know how we would convert, especially when we're scrambling for survival in the next many months. So we've been preparing for collapse. We are in collapse, but we're in the early stages still. And so that's a historically validatable statement I just made. Um, I could give the details, but we're just matching the pattern, large systems imploding, not being sustainable. I mean, we haven't even been dealing with the planet and the climate uh, emergency we're in now. Um, And that will just unfold. I mean, we've already set that in motion. You don't uh, suddenly stop the oceans from warming or the atmosphere from changing just by a few months off of pollution. So, but the, so the view is essential. You cannot be, take on this formation of one's leadership as now I'm really a warrior, a champion for, to preserve and protect the human spirit, people, and also the spirit of life. You can't take that on if you think there's any chance that we're pulling out of this. I think we get caught in this uh, hopefulness that because emergence is surprising that the future is wide open. But actually, if you just take a good scientific perspective here, what emerges is based on what is already present. And so there are limited possibilities in any living system, in anything that has shape and form, there are limited possibilities, not wide open possibilities. And so that's just uh, the way reality works. For me, the, uh, there's a kind of joy, gratitude, uh, celebration on the positive side that coexist, can completely deeply coexist with with grief and and, and a very uh, deep sobriety, uh, you know, present to the gravitas of, of all the human and more than human suffering that also is very real. Um, to me, just sort of being for the human spirit is being for 
what's right in front of me, but that opens to uh, whatever might emerge. I don't, I don't need to draw a line between the two for myself. I, I, I want to learn from you. I mean, my, my sense is okay. that the good work I would like to do is a team sport. Uh, it needs other people occupying different places, different spaces, existential spaces. And wise elder like yourself, who has forsaken all hope of a different possibility and who is stealing her heart mind to stay, to be present and to be a force of compassion and care in even the most hellish circumstances is an absolutely essential function. But I'm not sure that everybody has to emulate that in all its detail in order sure, to co-participate in something constructive. Well, I don't think most of the people who work with me are in the same place that I am in. Mm. Um, but I do want to go back to, I, I appreciate what you said that in some ways, whatever you're hoping for that might emerge, it doesn't change what you're doing now. It would be the same. But there is something to be warned here, which is that hope is always accompanied by fear. And so if the motivation for our work is based on a sense of if uh, I hope for this to happen, then when it doesn't happen, we move into a much deeper level of depression or anger or feeling powerless. And, you know, in Buddhist teaching, uh, all of our relationship to reality is summed up by the phrase of, well, you're working from hope, which means hope and fear. You can't distinguish them because, as one teacher said, expectations, and that's what we're talking about here with hope, expectations are just premeditated disappointment. <laughs> We're setting ourselves up for disappointment. And it's worse than that, a sense of despair and grief when all of our good plans, expectations, and work not only don't happen, but we see the reverse happen. What I'm working for all the time is we're not doing the work because we hope for a certain outcome. We're doing the work because it's the right work to do. And it's based on the deepest values of, um, of uh, morality, ethics, what is right, what is fair, what is good for human society. Um, and we just do the work as it shows itself. And we may do work for the long term, but we, which I think we have to do, but we hold it lightly. So when it doesn't happen, when it dematerializes, when it's defunded, when it just disappears, like so much has disappeared with the pandemic, um, we don't get undone by all the despair that floods through us. So if you're hoping for a certain outcome, you're setting yourself up to really experience terrible levels of despair and grief and anger uh, even. And so how do we work from clear seeing? How do we work from a place of this is the work that needs doing right now. I'm going to give it my wholehearted best shot. <laughs> I'm going to do everything I can to contribute to it, but I'm doing it for the present moment um, rightness of it. Which is why you're so fierce about cutting away the hope that keeps our motivation conditional and that's right that's inadequate right. to the task the, uh, that's what i really love and it's a big part of why i reached out to have this conversation it also though seems to me that at the very core of this there's uh, 
for each individual uh, a struggle. Uh, at, at times the sense that things are falling apart can feel profoundly disheartening. And, it should, it should. Uh, <laughs> Shows you're still alive. I had a conversation in this podcast series with the philosopher Peter Russell, who has yeah. for some time been quite clear that the self-accelerating nature of human creativity and cultural evolution is self-terminating. And for him, it releases to a place of no blame. You know, no blame for end times was the title we chose for that particular <laughs> episode. And and a kind of softening and well of course, of course, of course. You know, he 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 kind of it was it was like a deep softening and forgiveness that came over him. But I think that in every human heart there are many moments. There's there's also I mean, for me it is necessary for me to receive the gift of this divinely human moment, this breath, this, uh, there is wonder and gratitude that are, uh, you know, core to sanity. And it isn't dependent on some future moment, but it isn't taking a conditional stance in relation to a bleak future that is overwhelming the ability to simply receive and enjoy right. and savor yeah. and celebrate the gift of, of the miracle of the moment. And so I'm, um, and, and it does seem to me that when I do that, I coincide with much, much more creative possibility and whatever is possible that is worthwhile has a greater chance of coming into being through my way of being. So these are important to my own right. navigation. And, and the framing of a sense of, of uh, possibility, I think you're right. It easily, 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 it so powerfully tends to go to the place of hope that is coupled with fear and that is bound to be dashed and disappointed. But I think that the, um, the mood of my own sanity is not, uh, it's very serious. It has mm. profound sobriety, but it is not absent of humor and gratitude right. and, 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 wonder uh and, and so i'm i'm sure that you are working with many many people who are on in their own hearts and in their own journeys at various moments on the knife edge of despair and definitely but there's i think something in that instinct that gosh the being is healthy when it organizes positively toward whatever is possible i have to choose to organize in that way Right. It may be that I will then spin a story that's overly idealistic and, and hopeful and that I may set myself up for another cycle of disappointment and disheartenment. And there is a value in pointing that out, holding up that mirror, cutting out that delusion. But I don't think you're all about negating that, uh, that, that instinctive recognition I want, I, I have to be a yes. Somehow my soul said yes to being here in this time, right. this incarnation. There must be something beautiful and true and good about it. Well, I want to uh, actually affirm most of what you just said. And I, I think I want to uh, introduce a little bit of my own experience, but also the warrior vow which is a whole path and practice. So the danger, so present moment actions of service, of relating, of communion are the source of joy, period. I learned that a long time ago. Um, whenever we are truly present and in, in this state beyond our own egos, beyond our own needs, um, that is always an experience of joy. It's called communion. 
and it doesn't matter where you are. You could be on a battlefield, in a hospital ward, wherever you are. The external circumstances don't matter for the experience of joy. I'm not talking about happiness, I'm talking about joy. So for me, the meaning of life is can I be present moment to moment? Because I know that's where, for my own, uh, own spiritual cultivation, motivation, that I can be in an absolute rage about something Trump just did. I can be in absolute despair of realizing how many people are suffering in a particular category, for example. Um, and if I just turn and do something for somebody else, I am out of that. Um, that's part of it. But the fact is, this is a time when the more you open your heart to the world, the more suffering you will notice and take in. And therefore, feeling sad, feeling moments of despair, feeling moments of grief and rage, I just accept these as a fact of being, trying to be present in this world. So I'm not trying to push it away. I have to notice when I'm getting overcome, uh, especially with despair or anger. And then I just go do something else. But I have learned not to be afraid of these dark emotions, not to have to work with them, uh, but to expect them and also trust that they're momentary. My despair is momentary. It can be profound and overwhelming. But I also have learned now that it will pass. I don't stay there. I don't become suicidal. I just acknowledge it and it will move on. And then I go back to work. I have a, uh, one colleague who spends 20 minutes a day just yelling, ranting, and raving. <laughs> and then she goes back to work. I have another a warrior colleague who um, goes on walks that she designates as weeping walks. That is her time to just let go and cry while she's walking. I never know when I'm going to start crying. I mean, yesterday I went to visit my chiropractor and he's in a building that has a lot of sports activities, a lot of uh, hair salon, uh, Pilates uh, place, all these efforts, you know, for health and wellness and exercise and they're all shuttered. And I just found myself crying there, in part for what is now lost. And these people who ran these places have, are, must be suffering terribly from a loss of income. But from a time when we can even engage freely in those things, who knows? Um, and I just expect that I'm going to cry a lot. <laughs> I'm not afraid of it anymore. I'm not afraid of being overwhelmed. I've had enough of those moments and then I had to practice myself out of them or just go do something entirely different, physical especially. So that's, that's part of it. We just, this is being awake in the world. This is the reality that we're opening to. But the warrior's vow, which is a quote from uh, Choyum Trungpa in his wonderful work, Shambhala, the Sacred Path of the Warrior, uh, our vow, we're very serious, this is a vow, not a prayer or a promise. The vow is, I cannot change the way the world is. But by opening to the world as it is, I may discover that gentleness, decency, and bravery are available, not only to me, but to all human beings. The hardest challenge of that is the first line. I cannot change the way the world is. We all are people, if we're interested at all in warriorship, 
we have made a difference in the past and we continue to seek ways to make a difference. But the difference has changed because the times are different. I thought I could really change large systems. I thought I could work with all of those who were bringing great changes in perception, in policy, in accountability measures. We really thought we were gonna change the way the world is. Well, we failed. I cannot change the way the world is. And then there's the promise, the action. If I open to the world as it is, if I really work to take it in, and of course you have to do this little by little because it's so harsh. Um, but that's why we practice direct perception. That's why we make a commitment to be present and to open rather than close. So then the reward, which we are finding, is a shift in our behaviors. We become gentle or non-aggressive. We become decent, trustworthy people, trustworthy. Um, and we are brave. So what's so interesting to me about this vow, and I've worked with it for five years, is that the very behaviors I seek to be non-aggressive, gentle, trustworthy, decent, moral, and brave, the path to those is not through anything else except opening to the world. That's just not closing down. And, and this is my fear for us, that opening to this world is really challenging. <laughs> it's more than challenging. It's kind of terrifying at times. Yeah. Um, and I don't ask anybody in my circles to open to the world the way that I do, that this is my function, my role is to take in the world, not just what's happening in a small area. But I'm trained to do that, and I know how to overcome my despair and, uh, and what I see. But we open to our world, we open to our community, we open to our, as, as broad as you can bear. Because when you open to it, you will find the path of serving well, serving intelligently, sanely. And you will have these wonderful qualities of, of uh, gentleness, decency, and bravery. This is proven true. So it went from being a promise, now it's in, this vow works. To learn more about Margaret Wheatley's extraordinary work, and especially her Warriors for the Human Spirit project, go to margaretwheatley.com. For more conversations in this Post Doom series, you can go to postdoom.com and do check out the resources page as many of the resources that Meg Wheatley and Terry Patton discuss in this conversation and others related, especially the historic resources, are available there.